Hi, y'all. Thanks for joining us for another episode of Anthropological Airwaves, a venue for highlighting the polyphony of voices across anthropology's four fields and the infinite and often overlapping subfields within them. Anthropological Airwaves is the official podcast of the journal American Anthropologist. This is Season 5, Episode 4, Dismantling the Ivory Tower, Open Mic Edition, Part 2. My name is Anar Parikh. I'm the associate editor of the podcast at American Anthropologist and the executive producer of this show. This month, we're bringing you the second episode in a mini-series developed, produced, and edited by American Anthropologist contributing editor Nelly Aboud. The Contributing Editor Program is an editorial initiative for anthropologists at various professional stages in their careers to work closely with the journal's managing editor and with members of the editorial board to develop skills and build networks for their future careers inside and outside academia. Over the course of a two-year term, contributing editors gain insight into various facets of academic publishing and work on projects that speak to their thematic and geographic interests. Nelly is a freelance museum educator based in Beirut, Lebanon, and a contributing editor with the archaeology section at American Anthropologist. During the past year, Nelly has been working on putting together a pair of episodes about the production of archaeological knowledge in Lebanon, as told by young Lebanese archaeologists working in field and museum contexts. She's here to tell you about the series and today's guest. Welcome to Dismantling the Ivory Tower. My name is Nelly Aboud. I am a contributing editor in the archaeology section at American Anthropologist. In this anthropological airwave series, Lebanese archaeologists will discuss the exclusivity of archaeological knowledge and management systems in Lebanon and its influence on their careers as early or mid-career professionals. In Lebanon, Higher positioned archaeologists and museum workers rule this world from an ivory tower, making archaeological knowledge unreachable by the majority. This is contrasting with the new generation of archaeologists who are trying to change the status quo by spreading archaeological knowledge and expertise to a wider audience. Alas, most of the time the system does succeed in absorbing or rejecting them. In two episodes, I will be giving the floor to Young Voices to discuss the system characteristics and the ways in which the older generation of Lebanese archaeologists have separated themselves from the dominant political and social dialogue in Lebanon. I will be investigating these themes by asking two early and mid-career Lebanese archaeologists four identical questions about their main career concerns. How the social and political context in Lebanese archaeology affect their concerns, how archaeology and cultural heritage is taught, displayed, and shared in Lebanon today, and their thoughts on how to make archaeological knowledge more widely accessible in Lebanon. The recordings you will hear strive to create an open mic effect with minimal interruptions to give each guest the spotlight to describe, in their own words, their career struggles and their interaction between archaeology and social political identity in Lebanon. Each episode transcript will be available in both English and Arabic. In our second episode, we will be speaking to Sarah Madi, a PhD candidate at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, an adjunct lecturer at Montclair State University and Fordham University. She is of Lebanese origin and moved to the USA in 2015. When she was living in Lebanon, she was a full-time field archaeologist and a research assistant at the University of Palamon. Her PhD is on healing shrines in North Lebanon and the ways in which women and mothers have produced and used these spaces as part of their daily lives and lived religion. Among her research interests are the politics of archaeology in Lebanon, its history, and its current state. Hello, Nelly. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast today. It's really, uh, it's always a a pleasure to uh, discuss these issues with you. This is pretty much our regular conversation that we're, we're, we're just recording for a change. So yeah, thank you again so much. 
just to you know set the stage a little bit a little bit of who I am and where I am and how am I even connected to all these issues uh, I am of Lebanese origin I did leave Lebanon in 2015 and uh, you know as as difficult of a, of a decision it was just something that I had to do and uh, you know among other things that I left behind and, and people that I left behind and, and my entire life basically I was also leaving a career a career that I've been building since 2006 so there was a lot going on right and now that I'm focused on building my career here and in, in the U.S., I'm still very much concerned about the state of the archaeology field in, in Lebanon, right? It's not something that I just put behind me and um, walked away from. And yeah, I, I don't see how we can talk about current problems and issues without going back to the deep roots of these problems, right? I don't think we can solve anything without understanding how it came to life and how it was formed and morphed into the monster it is today. So really, many of the problems we're seeing today, I think, are the result of decades of colonialism, of politics enmeshed with religion, giving birth to sectarianism and issues with elitism and exclusivity. And these are all problems that have been trickling down from generation to the other. And they've they've taken over public spaces, they've taken over museums, they've, they've taken over academia, right? They're pretty much everywhere. And these are many problems that we're facing today and, um, you know, something that we can focus on um, if that's okay. To sort of, you know, talk about this in simple terms, the problems that we are facing today, they really go back to when, you know, what is today modern day Lebanon used to be under Ottoman rule. And then as the Ottoman Empire fell, it was replaced by the uh, French mandate of Lebanon and Syria. And, you know, of course, during the, this period in the early 1900s, France was set to establish, you know, their own ideologies, uh, establishing uh, their curriculum in schools and univers universities that they were founding, you know, and hospitals and different institutions, especially like the government, of course, and whatnot. But you know, th this is perfectly fine, perfectly normal when we're looking at a colonial setting. You're like, okay, France is here now. Um, they have their own um, curriculum, their own ideologies that they are uh, perpetuating and teaching and implementing. You know, it's like totally understandable in its setting. What is not understandable is why is this still the norm today? Lebanon supposedly gained its independence in 1943, right? Why are we still using the same teachings, the same syllabi, the same curricula that they have established and implemented in the 1920s and um, around that time period? Why are we still not even using this knowledge that they produced and this past that they imagined, but we are even glorifying many of these early quote-unquote archaeologists who um, were like the founding fathers of the field, right? But they were also very racist people. They were also looking down at all Lebanese people. They were looting and dismantling monuments and artifacts, taking them from, from our land, from our culture, from our families, to transport them to your European museums. These are the same people we are still glorifying today. And I think it was in the previous year that there was like this huge seminar or whatever, like big conference dedicated to uh, Ernest Renan. And all the talks and all the interventions were really glorifying this person who, in the words of his counterparts who lived, who lived around uh, and had the opportunity of meeting him, he wasn't that knowledgeable anyway. He wasn't, he wasn't very intelligent. He wasn't very, what's the word? Kind of like he didn't really know what he was talking about, right? Not to mention all the racist things he, he did and said and all the wrong information he perpetuated. And the fact that we glorified certain parts and bits of Lebanon over other historical events and facts. And here we are in the 21st century still saying, oh, thank you so much for teaching us all this stuff and for training us in the field of archaeology. And his Mission de Tunisie book is still like revered as, as, uh, as some sort of holy book. So yeah, this is, this is something that we can certainly dig deeper into. But mostly it's this problem that we 
need to learn how to fix. People all around the world are talking about decolonizing the syllabus and decolonizing the whatever. But you can't decolonize anything in a culture, in a community where they're very much happy being colonized, right? If they don't see that there's a problem with us glorifying certain people and their ideologies, and they don't see that, you know, it's it's really not okay to, to still have the same curriculum that was built in the early 1900s from a colonial power to establish very obvious colonial ideologies. Why are we still teaching this to our students? Why are we still glorifying these people and uh, using them uh, and our articles and citing them and doing these conferences and seminars to say how how great they were how are you going to decolonize anything if groups of Lebanese archaeologists and museum professionals and people who are working within the heritage do we call it industry I don't know people who are in heritage studies and museums and archaeology if they don't see that there's a problem how are you going to fix it then <laughs> So um, let's unpack a little bit of these issues we've been discussing, right? First of all, I, you know, I mentioned you can't really decolonize or you can't really fix any problem if you don't see that there is a problem. So if, if I'm going to take you back to, um, you know, how and when it all began, um, the roots of the problem we have to set the stage for the 1800s, right? The late 1800s, where what were Lebanese people doing in terms of heritage and history and archaeology? Pretty much what everyone around the Eastern Mediterranean was doing, if not elsewhere. People were aware that, you know, generations before them had inhabited this land and this landscape. But there was a, sort of this understanding of we understand we're different, we understand we have different religions, different practices, different places of worship, but that's okay. That's that's not a problem. It's not going to stop us from living uh, side by side and, you know, building this community together. At the same time, the Ottoman Empire had been ruling for quite some time. And what was happening is that Archaeology as, as a discipline, you know, wasn't even a thing. People would probably find some ancient artifacts while, while plowing their lands as they are farming. Probably, you know, some floods and droughts would move things around. Erosion would uh, expose some older artifacts. But people weren't actively looking for artifacts to study them and understand past cultures and societies, right? Like that wasn't really a thing in the 1800s. And then it started bit by bit by, you know, foreigners, Europeans being very curious about, about the ancient Near East or the Levant or whatever it's been called. And what was happening was that the only written source they had about this place was the Bible. You had the Old Testament and the New Testament, and people pretty much went from that. So for a European reader, especially one who has never been to any parts of the Eastern Mediterranean, you know, that was the land of Jesus, that was the land of the prophets. And there was also the, the memories of the medieval fights and the crusades and, you know, going back to Jerusalem and rescuing Jerusalem and all these different dreams and, and, and memories that Europeans had of the East. And then as they started traveling back to the region, they uh, really took the Bible as their only point of reference. They even treated the region as it was this static museum that ha has been frozen in time, you know, since the days of Jesus. And they were just looking for these ancient Eastern Christians and uh, looking at how people are still living the same ways as they have, uh, you know, since thousands of years. They really didn't see any development. Uh, they didn't see that, you know, the society, nope, has not been the same for 2000 years. It has been changing. It is a very vivid and alive culture. But, you know, they treated it as this ethnographic museum that's been frozen in time, right? And taking the Bible as the reference. And thus the interest in archaeology began to morph into what will become the discipline eventually. 
So you had the Ottomans who weren't very happy with the Europeans coming in and taking things to their museums. So they started implementing new laws and regulations to, you know, stop this trafficking of artifacts and monuments uh, from outside of the Ottoman land. Because it, it was like there was no Lebanon at the time, right? It was part of Ottoman land and it stretched even like way beyond the, the Lebanese borders that we know today. But at the time, it did belong to the Ottoman Empire, and they weren't very happy with the Europeans, uh, you know, taking things, uh, shipping monuments and artifacts to their to their museums. So they started establishing these rules, right, these regulations to stop these activities. And that was, you know, towards the mid to late 1800s. What was happening at the time was that the Ottoman Empire was in itself starting to, you know, crack and fall obviously thanks to European intervention. And eventually the, the Europeans established their powers along the Eastern Mediterranean. And so you'd have Lebanon, who became under French mandate, and Syria, you had Palestine, and that was under British mandate. Uh, and, you know, they just like cut up these borders that they created, basically, and each uh, colonial power took the peace for itself. And of course, the, the the French powers were very much interested in archaeology. They they loved archaeology because archaeology was a tool for them to um, justify their presence, right? So, for example, take Africa or North America when European colonialists would discover something like Great Zimbabwe, right, or the mounds in, in North America, they wouldn't admit that it was the ancestors of the people living here that you know, these were the people who built them. So they would say, no, these were like a lost tribe of Israel or like giants or, you know, like anyone but anyone but the local people who were still living in Zimbabwe or the local people who are still living in North America. Like, no, these indigenous people, of course, they didn't have, you know, the power and the capacity to build such gorgeous monuments and gigantic cities. So in our case, in the Lebanese case, it was different, right? Because they had a different agenda here. It wasn't like, no, 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 definitely not the African, definitely not the Native American. But it was, oh, look, the Roman ruins of our ancestors. We've been here before and we've been here with the, with the Crusades and we're here again. So for them, it wasn't a lost tribe of Israel or a giant or like whoever. It was them. It was their own ancestors. Um, so the French apparently forgot all about Gaul, it seems, <laughs> and their Celtic heritage. And they're like, okay, I guess we're Roman now. And yeah, it was a beautiful way for them to establish their presence that dated back millennia, right? Uh, to say that you know these are ancestors of ours, the, 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 the Roman ruins that you have today. And this is connecting us today to this land. And this justifies why we should be on this land today. And, uh, you know, it was like much more political and much more serious than what I make it sound. But that was pretty much the, um, the narrative that was, that was going on. And then you would have all these people that today we call Orientalists, right? Um, these travelers, these explorers, these like mid uh, to upper class people who are coming from Europe. They have like pretty much nothing better to do. And they're roaming, traveling the Eastern Mediterranean, looking for like awesome things to, um, to discover. They had no training in archaeology, right? Archaeology was still not a discipline at the time. You couldn't go to like the college of whatever and get a degree in archaeology. It was just like, dig, find something pretty, take it back home. And there, there was really a war between the museums. Like you would have Someone at, I don't know, a museum in Berlin saying, oh no, have you seen what they had at the British Museum? They have so much more beautiful stuff that we do. So we have to go out and get some more. And this is also the time when the cabinets of curiosities were morphing and developing into what became the museum ultimately. And I know this is a very sensitive topic for you, Nelly, like museums and such, but just like archaeology is, is rooted in a very dark history, so are museums just, you know, to, to make everything clear and, and all right. So yeah, that was, you know, everything was happening at sort of the same time. You have the cabinets of curiosities becoming, uh, you know, more and more established museums, more like quote unquote scientific museum or historical museum or whatever. And at the same time, you would have the colonial powers in these colonies uh, who are using archaeology and using the artifacts and the monuments as a tool to establish their 
presence and to justify, you know, why they're there and why they are able and capable of um, ruling this this people who like otherwise wouldn't know how to to rule themselves, right? So the focus was really on Roman sites and just take any touristic map of Lebanon, you're sure to find the majority of our archaeological sites are from the Roman period and specifically their temples, right? There's like too much, too much of an abundance. I think the number is like more than 200 or so of Roman temples in a tiny, tiny country of like uh, 10,000 and plus square kilometer so it's really insane and for people to look and see all these roman ruins and roman temples you know obviously what you would think oh yeah this is this is it this is the history of this people but what happened to prehistory right prehistory is such like a gigantic chunk of our timeline and we don't have any substantial places sites monuments even like dedicated to museums like there's the museum of of prehistory at the um, university of saint joseph but but that's pretty much it, right? Lebanon has a prehistory that is very rich and can inform us so much about the transition from what we call Paleolithic to Neolithic and, and so on. Like the Bronze Age and the Iron Age are like barely getting studied today, but anything even before is a big, as much as I hate the word, mystery, right? And there's so much to be done, but it's it was ignored and it's pretty much still being ignored. And what happened to the Hellenistic period, right? Like Alexander did, did a few things, right? There was like a lot of conversation between the Phoenicians, the, the Canaanites and, and the Greeks. And there was like so much beautiful art and culture that flourished during this period. Where is all this? Where's the medieval period? I could literally perhaps like use one hand maybe two hands to count all the medieval monuments that we have in Lebanon it's it's really it's it's mind boggling like i it's also it's also exhibited not only in our landscape but also inside our museums if if you if you go to the national museum in beirut most of it is roman artifacts there's like one or two tiny displays of medieval arab islamic artifacts it can't be no, it, it certainly cannot be that the entire Middle Ages could fit into two small display cases. There's certainly a huge problem here. We talked about how, you know, the disproportionate heritage uh, was, was used as a tool, right, to, to justify older European presence. But what is it doing to the local community? How... I mean, as, as a European, you're obviously seeing this as, oh, yeah, for sure. My ancestors were here during the Roman period. Uh, they helped build this land. So I do have claim over this land. But for, for the for the local people, for the for the Lebanese community, now they don't have any connection to that Roman period anymore because it's like, what, 2000 years old? And you can't trace back your family tree all the way there. So now you're thinking, oh, yeah, this doesn't belong to me. This is not my previous generations this is not my heritage and this is going to to create a whole set of problems that we're going to discuss later but yeah going back to how politics formed the discipline of archaeology specifically in lebanon when the colonial powers were still in lebanon in the 1920s they started having these local uh, museums more like temporary museums you know nothing nothing that lasted until today as far as i know and a lot was being shipped to France, obviously. There was very much, uh, how, how do you call it, a um, like a, a principle of finders keepers in a sense, right? Since France is leading the excavations, they are funding the expeditions, they are discovering the artifact, so they can claim ownership over it and they can ship it back to France. And, you know, the Lebanese are left with nothing or maybe replicas. Yes, I did say replicas that stayed in Lebanon where the originals were um, shipped off to Europe. And yeah, you would be left with basically the not so pretty, quote unquote, not so shiny, um, not so impressive artifacts, right? And all the beautiful ones would, would just leave. 
So at one point, there was uh, a group of Lebanese people who were trying to talk to the French and say, you know, like, this is ours, right? This is this belongs to Lebanon. And we we need to like claim ownership over this collection of artifacts. And the French were like, no, 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 this this can't happen. Because yeah, we funded we funded the discovery that led to these, uh, we funded the expedition that led to, led to the discovery of these artifacts. So we're just going to keep everything. And yeah, good luck. And um, <laughs> yeah, there wasn't no other recorded event this happened in 1923 and uh yeah other than than this one event where a group of Lebanese were like yeah can we can we get our stuff back and France was like no and it never happened again like that was it and I'm I'm not sure if it, if it happened uh, more recently but issues of repatriation in Lebanon are a big like like hush hush kind of situation where like, yeah, like, let, let's not talk about these issues, right? People don't want to talk about them. They want to avoid them. They specifically tell you to avoid talking about issues of repatriation. Like, no, this is not, this is not what we do, right? Like, let's not upset, let's not upset the people who looted our, our heritage. And uh, yeah, they can keep it. And uh, it's funny because you you hear of people who want to decolonize the museums and stuff like outside of Lebanon and uh, they're saying yeah like th- this narrative of the locals who are not able to um, to take care of their own artifacts and their own heritage is ridiculous and this is like what many african nations are doing today they're like no like we can take off we can take care of our own heritage like give us our stuff back um in lebanon it's the complete opposite people are like yeah no they're better off in france and like in turkey we wouldn't know how to take care of them like they are repeating these these words that they became so ingrained in our collective consciousness and we're like we believe them right honestly like people are talking to museum specialists to archaeologists and they're like yeah no they're better off where they are we we can't we can't take care of them you know they have them in these specific temperatures and the humidity levels and yeah so again how are you going to fix a problem if no one sees that there's a problem right like everyone is ignoring the elephant in the room and you're the only one who sees the elephant so yeah <laughs> that's um that's basically it that's basically it but yeah going back <laughs> i keep like running away and then coming back to to my main point so yeah what was happening during this time so yeah there was this event in 1923 where france was like nope can't have your stuff back and then a few years later france someone suggested that you know a a lebanese person could become not like the director of antiquities you know we're not we're not dreaming that big yet but you know just to just to have like it like a decent prestigious job right because up until this point Go back to the um when the Ottomans were excavating a little bit here and there, and like when the French like full blown took over, the Lebanese people weren't doing much, right? They, uh, as I mentioned earlier, like we were just like if you find something on your farm in your land in your backyard, like great, but people weren't actively looking for these things. So even when archaeology or excavations were starting to become a thing, Lebanese people were mostly the laborers. Like you didn't have like a ceramic specialist who's Lebanese, or like there was no ceramic specialist. But yeah, they 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 didn't have any of the of the academic jobs. They did, they weren't the policy makers. They weren't the decision makers. They weren't any of those things. So at one point, someone suggested to France, like, how about we include more Lebanese people? And um, this one guy. Uh, he's French and he was the director of antiquities and he's like no 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 these <laughs> these people are not um are not uh, I'm, I'm trying to remember the word he said um like they're not good enough right they, they're not they're not competent they we don't have any competent men in Lebanon who can take care of these jobs and yeah <laughs> just like wow Thanks, dude. And um, eventually, you know, years later, I, I, I guess, you know, he came around and then he suggested that how about we send students to France and they can study in France, they can do internships in France, and then they can come to Lebanon and we'll see if they are admitted to the um, to the Department uh, of Antiquities. You know, like <laughs> after we brainwash them in France, then <laughs> then we'll uh, we'll see if, if they can come in. And uh, yeah, one of these people was uh, the famous uh, prince Emir uh, Maurice Shab. In, in Lebanon, we know him as like the father of archaeology. He he was really like a stellar person, fantastic, fantastic human, fantastic archaeologist. And he surrounded himself with a very good team, including his his 
dear wife, Olga, and, you know, a lot of different archaeologists at the time. And he did wonders, you know, throughout his service. But anyway, when he was first chosen to to go to France, so he went and then he came back and bit by bit he climbed up the ladder. But th- this part about him climbing up the ladder, it wasn't because, you know, he was just brilliant. Because remember, this guy, this French guy was saying, we don't have any competent men in Lebanon, right? And suddenly you have this person who ultimately became the curator of a national museum, but also the director of the Lebanese Department of Antiquities. So like what happened? He was brilliant. I'm not saying otherwise, but he was also a Christian, a Maronite and a prince. And his father was a consul for France. So he had deep connections with France and also the fact that, you know, he comes from a very prominent family. He comes from a very rich family. He comes from a very Christian Maronite family who already had the Maronites had established very close, strong ties with Europe and France and Rome. So yeah, I can't imagine. I mean, I don't think it was a fair choice considering like, why wasn't it anyone else, right? Like, why him? But again, he, he in fact, was a brilliant person, you know, but the choice they made to, to you know, to choose him and to send him was very much enmeshed in politics and, and issues of religion and sectarianism and colonialism. It wasn't an innocent choice, uh, is what I want to say. So yeah, uh, Shab comes, he comes back to Lebanon and he's leading so many excavations and whatnot. But he's also, you know, he's he's still not fully independently making decisions on his own because he's still working with a lot of French people and not really colleagues, but they are, you know, his, his directors. They're not on an equal level. They are higher than him. And, you know, he has to agree with them. He has to report to them. So there was this whole debate over, you know, what belongs to Lebanon and what doesn't and what sorts of artifacts can we exchange and uh, which ones should we send and which ones should we keep. And uh, Shehab was very much agreeing with the French, you know, on anything they were saying when they said, yeah, this should be um, sent off uh, to uh, and, and, you know, shared with other museums. He, he'd agree. So, yeah, th- th- there wasn't any like a true independent Lebanese voice uh, during these meetings and and these moments where decisions had to be made, unfortunately. But yeah, this is this is also the time period when we are focusing a little bit more on Phoenician history, and this is <laughs> this needs its own podcast. <laughs> the issue with Phoenicians is that they didn't know they were called Phoenicians. First of all, those were people living on you know. The land of Canaan, basically the Canaanites, and they identified each with their own city state. So someone would say, I am from Sidon, I am from the city, that city, right? It was the Greeks who ultimately called them Phoenicians, right? But there's like a Phoenicomania. I don't know if I'm just inventing a new term in Lebanon, that people are really obsessed with their Phoenician heritage. And honestly, if you ask anyone anything about like, name five Phoenician archaeological sites in Lebanon that I can visit today and they just like blank or you know like tell me any Phoenician fact or anything we are just very much proud of this Phoenician heritage yet we don't know much about it and it's not their fault it's not the fault of the general public but it's what they've been taught and how they've been taught so yeah it's (laughs) it goes back to selectively choosing bits and pieces of our history to teach it to excavate it, to display it. And ultimately, you have a general public who knows virtually nothing about its history, about where it comes from, right? And this is this is very dangerous. It's it's really dangerous when you don't know where you came from and where where you belong. So yeah, a lot of people started claiming this new identity of Phoenicians and uh, some people called themselves uh, like there was this whole movement called the Phoenicianism and you know they they wanted to um, make everything Lebanese uh, pure Lebanese you know without any other influences right but at the same time this movement this Phoenician movement was claiming that they didn't want any foreign influences but they were in fact leaning more towards France and quote-unquote the West. So even when they were trying to claim a Lebanese identity, a pure Lebanese identity, there was something very Western about this identity. And this certainly goes back to how 
colonial powers have established this notion of you know our ancestors, the, Ro- the Romans and the Crusaders, like they, they were here and these are us, you know, that this is our history and our heritage that you have on your land today. So, yeah, I, do, I don't know. I don't know, Nelly. We've been, we've been talking about this for, for years. And, um, yeah, I still stand by, by what I've been saying earlier. You can't fix the problem if you don't understand its roots and how it came to life. And my concern now, my main concern, and how I would like to fix this issue is just build these connections between the general public and their heritage and this is something i'm trying to do in my own dissertation it's just to remind people that you know this is your heritage guys claim it uh be proud of it uh right there's there's so much beauty in lebanon there's so much history but most of all there's so much diversity and instead of fighting over our differences it It'll be ideal and beautiful if we can go back to these earlier periods where people were just okay being different. Um, you know, not to not to uh, make it sound like too utopic, but yeah, I I don't think you can fix anything. I don't think you can decolonize anything if people are happy or people think they're happy where they are. So to fix this is to communicate with the Lebanese public first of all. And then see how how they would like to proceed. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna end this by saying um, thank you again for for hosting this and for having me. I probably talked everyone's ears off, but it's uh, it it's been a wonderful opportunity to uh, to talk about uh, the roots of this problem. And yeah, I look forward to continuing this discussion with you. Thanks for listening to another episode of Anthropological Airwaves. This episode was written, edited, and produced by Nelly Aboud, with additional production support from Anar Parikh. Congratulations to Nelly for her persistent work on this series over the past year, and thank you to Sarah Madi for her willingness to share her perspective with our listening audience. This episode features the track Hanging Moon by Letrio Jubran. As always, a closed caption version of all Anthropological Airwaves episodes, including this one, will be available on our YouTube channel, and a full transcription on the episode page on the American Anthropologist website. In addition to our standard English transcription, Nelly has also transcribed the episode into Arabic. Links to both are included in the show notes. If you have enjoyed this conversation, be sure to subscribe to Anthropological Airwaves wherever you listen to podcasts. Also, Help new listeners find the show by rating and reviewing us while you're there. We would also love to hear from you in general. If you have feedback, recommendations, or thoughts on recent episodes, send an email to amanthpodcast at gmail.com. You can also reach out to us on the journal's Facebook page or on Twitter with the handle at amanthrojournal. Find links to all of our contact information in the show notes and on the Anthropological Airwaves section of the American Anthropologist website. That's all for today, folks. We'll be back in your ears soon with more great anthro audio. Thank you.